Okay, well, welcome. Uh, in the series, I'm entitling Reflections from Pharmacy Leaders Advancing the Profession. It's my pleasure to welcome uh, here um, Dr. Amy Haddad, who is uh, now Professor Emeritus in the School of Pharmacy and Health Professions at Creighton University uh, School of Pharmacy in Omaha, Nebraska. Uh, she was also a professor in the College of Nursing there. Uh, and as well as the director of the Center for Health Policy and Ethics. Uh, she's recognized as a leader in pharmacy and healthcare ethics, education and scholarship. Uh, and also I know that she's very passionate and has a love for the arts and humanity. She recently completed her master's in fine arts in creative writing. Um, she has served in leadership roles in, in professional association, past president of the, society, uh, the American Society of Bioethics and Humanities. And I believe uh, some years ago, she was recognized by AACP for the Chalmers Distinguished Educator Award. Uh, and recently, congratulations, recognized as an American Academy of Nursing Fellow. So it's my pleasure to welcome uh, Dr. Haddad. All right, so we'll start off this interview. Uh, so we would like to learn more about your journey, your journey in terms of your, uh, your career, basically, and, and your development as a leader. Uh, and, and in that journey, you may want to comment on key events or people that really influence you in, in your journey. Well, you know, I, I don't know if everybody has the same kind of um, journey that I have had because I started my career in nursing. And I, after finishing my BSN, I worked in um, medical surgical nursing for a while, then psychiatric mental health. And when I was working in psychiatric mental health nursing inpatient, um, one of my teachers um, from my bachelor's program had students there. And she kept, when she'd see me, she'd say, when are you gonna get your master's degree? Well, I had never even thought about getting a master's degree. So I'm, I'm bringing that up at this point because I think there's opportunities for all of us to encourage people to go on in their education. And I wonder to this day, if she hadn't planted that seed, if I would have even thought to go ahead and do that because no one really brought it up um, when I was in school. So I decided I would get my master's in med surge because we were missing a lot of medical surgical problems in our inpatient um, psychiatric patients. So I finished that and I didn't end up going back to work in mental health. I ended up teaching um, nursing at the College of St. Mary's, a small liberal arts college. And I hadn't really meant to be a teacher, but I found that I really loved it. So it was an opportunity that was presented to me and I thought, well, I'll try it for a while. And if I don't like it, I can go back to clinical practice. But by teaching nursing, I was actually still in clinical practice because I had students on the floor with me all the time. And so I continue to be interested in how people learned and, you know, what, what worked, what didn't work. Um, and then I ran into issues clinically because now I felt I knew what I was doing as a clinician. Um, but there were these problems that came up that didn't fit neatly into how well I, you know, started an IV or did some kind of treatment with the patient. And I came to understand that those were ethical issues. And I went to workshops and things like that. And then I thought, well, I need to learn more about this. I really want to have it be a part of what I do in clinical practice because I found it really troubling to me. Um, and I appreciated that there were like, there's this tradition and there are some better answers to the things that I was experiencing and ways to manage it. So I started to work on my PhD and during that time, when I was working on my dissertation, I got asked by the a pharmacy uh, school at Creighton University uh, to cover a new class that they had in required ethics. I mean, you know, it was a required course in ethics, a three-hour semester course. A friend of mine had taught it, and she was taking a job back east, and she said, well, I recommended you. And I said, well, I don't know anything about pharmacy. And she said, well, you know, you learn. <laughs> Um, so it was an interesting moment in humility because the bachelor's program in pharmacy at that time, this would have been in maybe 87, mm -hmm. um, you know, it was, it was a small, maybe 50 students in the cl whole class and they were third year students 
And so I was really honest about this. I went to the library and I tried to find everything I could on pharmacy ethics. And I'll have to tell you at that time, there wasn't much. I mean, I was kind of relieved in a way because I thought, oh, you know, look at medicine and even nursing at the time, there was a lot. Right. So I read what I could. And then I said to the students, you're gonna to have to teach me about what's important to you. So some of these life lessons in your career, I guess I'd try and pull out from the personal to more like, how could you apply this to other people? I was given opportunities to do things that I hadn't necessarily prepared to do. You know, I didn't know at the start of my career I would teach. I didn't know that I would move between one clinical specialty to another. I didn't know that now I'd be teaching in a school with a completely different discipline. To my great relief, the students were very happy to teach me about what it meant to be a pharmacist because I really, I had no preconceived notions. It wasn't like I, I thought I knew. I, I didn't really know. Mm -hmm. And um, so I think to take advantage of those opportunities that are presented to you to stretch and also be a little bit humble about what you don't know so that others can, even people who are we looked at education, were less experienced than I was in that way. They knew more about their discipline than I did. Um, and I will say my f colleagues in the School of Pharmacy, and still are, the most welcoming, helpful, glad to have you on board sort of group. Um, and I don't know if that extends to all pharmacy programs, but I will say even being involved in AACP, I was always welcomed so graciously and with open arms. And I don't know if in nursing, pharmacists would be greeted the same way. So I felt very fortunate that I had colleagues that said, you know, what do you have to bring to the table? And that job of teaching that one course turned into eventually becoming a department chair in the School of Pharmacy. We had a social and administrative science department. Mm -hmm. I was the chair of that department. I went on to be an assistant and then an associate dean. And again, I never said to myself, I want to do these things in my career. Um, but I have a tendency to be interested in things that are at the borders or that kind of cross disciplines. I think that's more interesting than just being only in one path. And maybe that's why I was willing to say, okay, I'll learn, you know, I'll, I'll try this. I, I taught a class in pharmacy, for example, outside of ethics on, um, oh, non-drug related products. So like things in the pharmacy that you would teach people how to use. Over like powder. Yeah, over sure. powder, thank you. But not the <laughs> drug part necessarily. Not the drug part. Right. Yeah, like I taught with a partner who taught the over-the-counter drug products, but we, partnered it with things like, where do you find the right size in adult um, urine protection pants? Where do you right. find Sur Medical surgical supplies. Yeah. And, yeah. It was, wow. and the students really appreciated it. And I learned a whole lot about, you know, what pharmacists are called upon to do beyond being the drug expert, you know, because you pharmacists are available to people and they ask all sorts of health questions. And so I thought, well, whatever I can help with, I helped with the patient assessment course, was often told by my um, pharmacy colleague that I was too nursey in my approach to it. <laughs> um, but then I learned from them the things in a, a patient assessment that are really critical to evaluating drug therapy. And it wasn't that nurses are blind to that. It's just that we have a different focus. Um, and so I think all of those things enriched my perspective on um, patients and, and what they need, uh, and also working interprofessionally, you know, really finding out that we use the same words and they mean different things. Mm -hmm. and, and so it's not now that we're really all over in a professional practice and you know how to work across teams and all of that, um, it's really come in handy because I had to do that a long time ago. So I think those are things, um, you know, my journey. And then maybe to say a little bit about the people that, that helped me. Um, and I, I thought a lot about that idea of who were your mentors and colleagues along the way. Again, 
um, people that you don't think at first might be in that role end up being that way. My advisor for my master's degree, Janine Boosinger, who had been like an army nurse and just tough as nails, he followed me into being on my PhD committee. Mm. So I had her guidance through my master's in nursing in med surge and then on into what I was doing in education for my PhD and was always in my corner. I mean, I think you need mentors that'll help you grow, but also back you up. And she was one of those people. You know, she was the only woman on the committee and that was really important to me. I wanted to have someone who I knew and someone who I knew would back me up if I needed that. Um, go on, sorry. How did you, how did you um, explain your later passion and interest in the fine arts? Because that occurred, so you got involved. You know, uh, without you know, you could. I think you could talk for hours, but we don't have hours. But uh, how did you get interested in uh, all of a sudden uh, the fine arts, and the humanities, and creative? Um, I had been, I had been involved in what was at that time the Society for Health and Human Values, and a colleague said you need to go to this meeting. So once again, when someone tells you something like that, eventually you should do it. And I went. And here was all the humanities, you know, in healthcare. And all these people whose names I had read because I was teaching ethics. Right. I mean, you know, it was just amazing. And it was things, you know, with poetry and literature and, and art and theater and visual arts. And, and I thought, oh, this can add such an element to what I'm doing in teaching ethics. For example, case studies are very constrained, small, little, very prescribed way of writing. And don't give you a very much of a picture of what someone's life is like and, and background and all of that. So you can use literature or poetry to help bring that in. Um, and I used film then, um, not always health related. It, it took some doing with the students sometimes that why are we watching this? But you know, uh, again, like these interviews, Everything had to be short to fit into the time that I had. And now, of course, with everything being online, um, but I think going forward, it'll always be hybrid. It's really good to have some visual things that you can supplement. You can listen to people read their poetry, um, which helps students sometimes too, when they see poetry on the page, but when they hear it, it's a different experience. Um, and I just think they bring a richness and, um, just, and, and I'm fascinated by it. And I love poetry because it really condenses down. So that's the opposite of what I'm just saying. Some of these things open it up like novels and plays, but poetry just, you know, squeezes everything out so that you get to the essentials. And I like that kind of um, challenge. And I, I like to do that kind of writing. That's great. That's great. So I'm going to move on here. Um, so th this is a question I ask people is, what do you think will be your legacy in 20 years? And, and I, I paraphrase that often uh, to, to, the com to the question, uh, reflecting on your contributions, um, what are you most proud of to help that really help advance, in, in our case, the pharmacy profession? Because for most of your academic career, it's been in pharmacy. Um, sure. I think I would like to, I, I will say this to, as evidence of this. I am, I haven't taught the pharmacy ethics course at Creighton probably for at least 10 years, maybe longer. And I still get called to do things in pharmacy ethics. Mm -hmm. So because of the textbooks that are out there and other publications that I have done, um, there is still an interest in um, my representing the, the pharmacy side of things and ethics discussions, which is wonderful. I am not a pharmacist though, and I'm not a currently practicing pharmacist. So I find the need now, and I always have done this, if I don't have the expertise that I need clinically, then I bring a pharmacy colleague you know, into the discussion with me. So it's, it's just so critical to get the information correct about drug therapy. Mm -hmm. um, so I think my work in pharmacy ethics, we have, we're on the third edition of a textbook in case studies in pharmacy ethics. Mm -hmm. I don't know if we'll do a fourth. Um, Bob Veach, who is also a mentor of mine um, and a pharmacist, I can tell you he hasn't practiced probably in 40 years. Wow. He 
still called on to represent pharmacy. Today, this actual day, there is a piece on the Hastings Center website that he has written about clinical trials, the ethics of clinical trials, and chloroquine. Am I saying that right, chloroquine? Chloroquine. Chlor chloroquine. The anti-malaria, hydroxychloroquine, chloroquine, right. With so he's writing the article today. Wow. Now, now that is interesting. So I would say there is certainly room <laughs> in the next 20 years for other pharmacists, an academic probably, because I don't know clinically if you'd had the time, but if you could pair up with someone in academia to really get into being the pharmacy voice right. in these issues, right. that ethical implications. Absolutely. Yeah, that's, that's, yeah, wonderful. Thank you for that. Uh, and I know you've already given us, uh, given our students some advice, but other ed words of advice concisely in terms of their professional journey. And again, uh, focus on developing themselves as leaders. And when I use the term leaders is little L, people who can influence people to advance, to change the profession, particularly sure. advance the profession. I would say all along your career, whenever you have the time, and I understand everybody's very busy when they're in their primary program of study and, and getting done, but I have found that the opportunity to serve in professional organizations, and I know people always said this when I was in school and I thought, no, but it's true. Um, it's very helpful. It, you meet people. You you have opportunities that you wouldn't otherwise have by just attending a meeting. So I've always offered to serve on committees when there was that opportunity. Um, and sometimes you get stuck on a committee that's not very much fun, but you learn a lot. I've been chair of governance committees on more organizations than I ever care to count, but it's a good thing to know. I mean, it's a good thing to know about governance in, a, in an organization. I would also encourage you to be active in non-health related community organizations as not-for-profits in whatever area you know interests you education the arts whatever because that's another way to develop leadership skills with a diverse group of people because in in a profession you might only be with people who kind of do the same thing that you do in a community organization i just got appointed to the nebraska arts council so I get, I get to, and see, I say that, they always go, you're one of the few people that say you get to review grants, but grants in the arts are fascinating to me. Yeah, yeah. And I get to learn about it, what's happening all over my home state where I've lived all my life. And I'm finding out every single time we do this, things that I never knew were happening. Wow. So for personal enrichment, that's lovely. I am not trying to you know, raise my hand too often and say, okay, I'll chair a committee or I'll do that, but I'm still engaged in different community activities where I really learn things. And so when people say there's no opportunities for leadership, I don't understand that because at any level in organizations, they are always looking for people to give their time and their talents and yeah. Yeah, very good. Thank you very much for those remarks. And my last question, since this is a history course, we'll, it will be studying the decade of the 2020s. And one of the key blip in that decade, or I don't know if it's a blip, key event in that decade will be the COVID-19 pandemic. And I really believe that uh, like other critical events in our history, that will be an event that will, ha will shape the, the profession for the future. And it will be one that people say, well, because of that, this was a turning point in and, and obviously looking at it as a turning point in a positive way, opportunity for the profession. Can you comment about that? I'd like to hear your perspectives. I guess I would go back to what I said about seeing the article today by yeah, Bob. Bob I, I love him. His, his work will be really good. But where are the pharmacy voices in all of this? Now, maybe I just have, have, have not seen them there, but where I look online are things in ethics. And so maybe the, the pharmacist's presence is there and I'm just missing it. If it's not, then I would say that pharmacy needs to be more front and center about what it is that they're doing. Mm -hmm. Every time we mention all the wonderful health professionals who are doing all this work, pharmacy should be among them, okay. always. Okay. Because without them, we've got people doing, you know, I'd love to see a pharmacist explain to, you know, in an op-ed piece or something about, Here's what off-label use means, right. you know, so that they could understand 
why that uptick in these prescriptions for a drug that hadn't really been tried in this way happened, right? I mean, I don't think the public understands that. And so there's a role for pharmacists that I haven't seen. And if it's just because I haven't seen it, ignore this. But if it's true, where have they been in all of this? Because I know they have so much to offer. Absolutely. Well, that, that's great. That's a good challenge for, for the people listening, you know, to, to be looking at opportunities to be advocating for our profession. And, uh, and it, obviously that creative writing there, op-ed people, you know, <laughs> uh, we, need to, we need to build our writing skills in our, in our profession. As a, well. a local paper. It I mean, it's an yeah. op-ed in the New York Times. Exactly. I mean, Local, yeah, exactly. Yeah, right. got it. Well, um, Amy, uh, thank you very much for this. I really appreciated this. Thank you.